له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise due to Allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and I bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah We are continuing to look at Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th chapter of the Quran. And uh, in the previous session, we completed verses 19 and 20, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, described His wakening the youths who had fallen asleep, uh, describing it as being miraculous, and we discussed that, how in fact it was even more miraculous than putting them to sleep. and um the issues of time spent them being unable not being aware of the time which was spent they asked each other and we talked about the implications of that with regards to our own selves when we sleep when we wake being unconscious of what is past in time and we compared it to death when a person dies uh, until yawm al-qiyamah he is no longer governed by time so we don't have a problem in dealing with the idea of people dying 10,000 years in the past uh, and they will be meeting the qiyama or the resurrection the same time as the rest of us and we talked about um a number of issues there are actually many many issues in this verse uh whether, whether we talked about the food and the types of food that they sought um we also talked about uh their situation their position that they had to be careful in trying to uh, get the food that they needed because they awoke hungry but at the same time Allah had set certain things in place which would expose them but from their perspective they would take precaution and uh, this is a part of islamic teachings that you know we as they say prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said tie our camels you know we tie our camels meaning that we don't just trust in Allah without making some effort on our own parts so they took what efforts they could but of course in the end it was with Allah um at the end of that verse we mentioned there that um uh, we mentioned a number of different benefits which could have been taken from the verse but we also mention at the end that for them if they had been caught and had been forced back to their state of disbelief as they said uh we would have never been successful from this part of the verse a number of scholars concluded that in the past prior to the final revelation of islam there was no excuse for those who were forced meaning if you had a choice of expressing disbelief or death you would express your belief and die that there was no choice involved this is what is implied by the statements of the youth that if they had turned us forced us back we would never have been successful whereas as we know uh from the islamic perspective we are excused uh for situations where we have been forced prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself had said in allah tajawaz an ummati al khata wal nisyan وما استكره عليه indeed allah has excused my followers from genuine mistakes forgetfulness and what they have been forced to do and i gave you the example of uh, ammar ibn yasir and his parents that there are these two different levels that are there that second level of expressing disbelief while holding uh belief in one's heart that this 
was an option for some scholars felt that this was an option presented uh, to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for his ummah and that the previous generations they didn't have this option right uh, we had in surah nahl uh, verse 106 allah says there allah's wrath and, and great torment is on whoever disbelieved in allah after believing whose hearts are open to disbelief except the one who is forced while his heart is at rest with faith so this is the excuse this is the opening for those who f- are forced into making statements of disbelief uh, as I said, this was a position held by some scholars. Of course, it is something debatable um, uh, because uh, you know, we don't have clear ed- evidence. It is something deduced from the verse. Uh, other scholars don't necessarily agree with it because in the uh, hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, where it says that you know, the, the Allah has excused my followers from genuine mistakes. So, I mean, even genuine mistakes, if we consider... I mean, that a person makes a mistake that is outside of his control, Allah excuses us. I mean, is it only our ummah that has been excused? Those in the past who made genuine mistakes were not excused. So the argument is not, uh, we could say, you know, solid 100%. It has an element of, of uh, truth to it, possibly, but it is not something we can say with surety. Anyway, if we carry on to verse uh, 21, where Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَعْثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقٍّ وَأَنَّ السَّاعَةَ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهَا إِذْ يَتَنَازَعُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ أَمْرَهُمْ فَقَالُوا ابْنُوا عَلَيْهِمْ بُنْيَانَا رَبُّهُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِهِمْ قَالَ الَّذِينَ غَلَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِمْ لَنَتَّخِذَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ مَسْجِدًا In this way, I caused them to be found, so that they would know that Allah's promise is true. And the hour of resurrection is coming without a doubt. When they were disputing among themselves about their case, some of them said, Construct a building over them. Their Lord knows best about them. Those who prevailed in their case said, Indeed, we will build a place of worship over them. Allah begins this 21st verse with the same phrase, وَكَذَٰلِكَ أَعْثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ uh, in this way, I caused them to be found. Meaning that he's relating back the way in which he raised them up, the way in which he put them to sleep, you know, all of this, the way in which he caused them to be found. All of them are a part and parcel of Allah's uh, great greatness. It is an expression, you know, of his wisdom. Uh, he set them up in such a way that though they thought they would be able to go into the town and buy food and come back, quietly without anybody finding them, Allah had already set the stage that they were going to be found. So, uh, the commentators uh, spoke about this circumstance uh, because there are actually no narrations, authentic narrations from the Prophet ﷺ to actually describe what took place. Uh, scholars of tafsir, some of them have relied on texts from Christian sources, uh, which they refer to in general as Israeliyat, all of those which, things which come from uh, Christian Jewish sources they refer to as Israeliyat. And they're not really you know, something that we can base solid uh, evidence on. It's not no harm in looking at it uh, where it agrees with what we have. We can say, yes, this appears to be true. Where it contradicts what we have, we say this is obviously false. And where it neither contradicts nor agrees, we say, hmm, Allah knows best. You know, so uh, the commentators comment, you know, su- suggested that when the youth went to buy food and paid for it in money, which was 309 years old, right, the people of the town <coughs> probably, this is their, sur- their surmising here, suspected that they found some kind of treasure. Because if somebody brought some money from, you know, gold coins or silver coins from 300 years ago from the 17th century, you know, and tried to buy things with it, you know, people would think, hey, they must have found some, you know, some treasure, buried treasure somewhere. This is the usual conclusion that people are going to come to. But of course, there was a lot more to them than just that. They spoke in a dialect which was dead for 300 years. Imagine people speaking to us now in Shakespearean English, right? 
somebody trying to talk to you and communicate with you in Shakespearean English, how it would sound. So obviously when they came in to try to, to purchase their food, there not only was the money strange, but here they were talking in a strange way. And not only that, even their clothing. Because remember, again, you know, styles are changing. Styles are changing as time passes. Uh, if we look back to the way people dressed 300 years ago, you know, it is quite different from today. So we could say that really all of their whole state must have aroused suspicion. And um, the townspeople, you know, would have questioned what is going on, why is this, why you're, you know, eventually uh, they would, they have found out now about these people that in fact they were from an earlier time because of course when they would try to relate to their circumstance, they would be describing incidents of 300 years in the past. And the story about the sleepers was known, it was circulating. We call, they were referred to as the seven sleepers of Ephesus, right? Uh, so this, this uh, story had been circulating, it had continued to circulate. So once they mentioned that it was, they were the ones who had, you know, had to flee and so on, so they made the connection. So uh, in that way, Allah caused them to be exposed. And in doing so, He, as Allah said, would make it clear that Allah's promise is true. What is Allah referring to here when He's saying that لِيَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حق, So that they would know that Allah's promise is true. What promise is, is, is Allah referring to here? Uh, the scholars of Tafsir explain that this was the promise that He would save the believers from the disbelievers. Because the seven youths escaped from a great nation which sought to prevent them from worshipping Allah alone. That ultimately, those who stand firm for the truth, Allah's promise is that He would protect them. In Tansurullah, Yansurkum, it is there in the Quran. If you support the religion of Allah, you stand firm for that religion, then Allah will give you success. He will support you. And then Allah goes on to say, and, that, and the hour of resurrection is coming without a doubt. That there... Uh, being found was on one hand to affirm the promise of Allah to protect the believers and secondly that the promise that, that the resurrection, the hour of resurrection was coming without a doubt. And from this uh, second part scholars have said that this in fact refers to uh, a doubt which existed at that period of time. You know, um, this now uh, we assume that uh, in, if it is from the period of, of Decius, uh, that in this time, uh, 300 years later, there was some controversy, controversy about the issue of resurrection itself. Uh, of course, most Christians, because that area was a Christian area by then, believed in resurrection. But the question is, was that resurrection a bodily resurrection and spirit, or was it only in spirit? So what happened is that the idea that it, it was only in spirit, it became the common idea. There was argument still going on at that time about it. It is now the standard idea amongst Christianity that resurrection is the spirit only and not the body. And there are references which are drawn from the Bible to support this uh, position held by uh, Christian, the Christianity, the Christian world in general. And um, this is why when, for example... You know, Ahmed Didat, you know, argued that uh, Jesus was not resurrected. Uh, in the Gospels, Jesus, according to the account of the Gospels, came to his disciples and they were shocked that he was, you know, still apparently alive. And he showed them his hands and let them put their finger in his hands, you know, to see that there were actually wounds, supposedly. I mean, of course, this is a story, right? We don't believe this. Uh, but as, as their text presented, uh, that they touched his hands and that was proof that he wasn't resurrected. Because according to their theory, their belief, resurrection is in the spirit. So how are you going to be touching a spirit and putting your hand in the blood? No. Right? So this was among the arguments which Ahmadi that used to prove to Christians that 
even the story that they have in the Bible does not support their claim for Jesus' resurrection. Um, of course, from our perspective, it is both body and spirit. And um, because of this belief, we do have uh, Westerners coming from their own tradition of spiritual resurrection, you know, accusing Muslims of being, um, uh, you know, sensuous because we talk about paradise and the things of paradise, the fruits and the, the pleasures of paradise in a very physical sounding way. And to them it's like uh, considered to be unacceptable because it's not spiritual. Resurrection is not spiritual. And this is why also uh, Yusuf Ali, Maulana Yusuf Ali, when he did his translation of the Quran back in the 30s, uh, he did make changes to the text. To, in, his, in his commentary, he, uh, he talks about resurrection and says that it is not physical that it is in fact the resurrection of souls and spirits. You know? And that these references to the pleasures of paradise, physical pleasures, these are metaphorical expressions. You know? He tried to explain it away because, I mean, he, I mean this was his own ijtihad. <laughs> you know? It's not correct, but it was his own ijtihad, you know, trying to make Islam more acceptable to the Western mentality. You know, he leaned towards this more spiritual interpretation. And um, it is also a general uh, leaning of, of Sufism, you know, towards explaining away the physical to spiritual meanings behind it, etc. And, I mean, this is part of his own uh, personal leanings. Anyway, Allah brought those youths back to life as proof that resurrection was not only spiritual, but it was the bodily resurrection. And this was proof for the people of that time. Allah goes on to say, when they were disputing among themselves about their case, because Allah had caused their story to be known once, you know, you can imagine, we found some people alive after 300 years, news is going to spread like wildfire. So their case became known all around. So, you know, people were now disputing what was going to happen to them. The different stories which are narrated about, uh, about them after they brought the people back, to, uh, the, those that were in the town, took the others, the people, townspeople, to the cave where they were, and they saw the people, they came out, saw them, they went back in the cave and they died. I mean, uh, this is what is narrated from uh, Christian and other sources. We don't know exactly what took place, only that uh, Allah said, that while they were dis disputing about the case, what to do with them? Because the situation was quite strange, quite unusual, you know. What do we do in their case? Some of them said, uh, construct a building over them, their Lord knows best about them. Right? And this was uh, basically the opinion that they should seal the mouth of the cave and leave them as they are. Right. Seal the mouth of the cave and leave them as they are. Assuming they're dead, because again, the idea of closing the mouth of the cave if they're alive inside there, that's like killing them. So we assume that they must have died, and they said that's the best way to deal with this situation. Just seal the mouth of the cave. However, those who are in authority, as the verse says, those who prevailed in their case, we assume that these are the people of authority, it, they said, indeed, we'll build a place of worship over them. So instead of covering them up and hiding them, you know, so that no trace about them would be known to later uh, societies for fear that people would come and start maybe worshiping them or whatever, they dis the authorities decided to build a mosque over them for prayer. And they built it with the intention, with a good intention, of uh, remembering the situation of these youths and what happened to them, remembering the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, this was in fact an error. This was in fact an error. This was not an instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that this should be done. It became a common practice amongst uh, the Christians and amongst the Jews to a certain degree, 
to build places of worship wherever their prophets died or wherever saintly people died. And this practice also creeped in amongst Muslims. In the early generation, of course, there was no room for it because Prophet Muhammad Wasallam had instructed his companions to go out and level all graves with the ground. Ali radiallahu anhu was instructed by the Prophet Wasallam in Sahih Muslim to go out and any grave he found more than a palm's width above the ground, he should level it with the ground. And the Prophet Wasallam, he had given a, a number of instructions you know, concerning uh, the graves and, and the graveyards, etc. Whether it is uh, the prohibition <coughs> of worship in graveyards, for example, Prophet Sallallahu had said, كُلُّ الْأَرْضِ مَسْجِدٌ وَطَهُورٌ إِلَّا الْمَقْبَرَةِ وَالْحَمَّامِ All of the earth is a masjid, except graveyards and toilets. So prayers in graveyards, although we now find it, Practice in Muslims, amongst Muslims. Prayers in graveyards uh, is uh, forbidden. We also had the Prophet Sallallahu saying, Sallu fi buyutikum, wala tattakhiduha qubura. Pray in your houses, do not make them graveyards. Of course, these hadiths are in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So pray in your houses, don't make them graveyards. What is understood from that? If you don't pray in your house, your house is like a graveyard. Where are you? Don't pray. So prayer in graveyards is without a doubt something not permissible Islamically. Now some people will go there and they'll make fatiha at the grave. They'll make dua, they read portions of Quran, etc. But we can see this is not uh, supported by the text of the Quran. And this was not supported by the Prophet ﷺ himself in his own practice. And even to pray in the direction of graves is not permissible. Prophet ﷺ had also said, لا تصلوا إلى القبور ولا تجلسوا عليها Do not pray towards graves nor sit on them. Even the direction of graves, the Prophet ﷺ forbade praying in their direction. And this is among the things that is a, something of a fitna you find in Masjid al-Nabawi, where people will come into the mosque and they will turn towards the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and pray in his direction. But this is, of course, not permissible in Islam. I mean, there are clear instructions from the Prophet ﷺ, uh, not to do so. Uh, furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in terms of even the recitation of Quran, uh, we have another narration from him, from the Prophet ﷺ, in which he said. Do not make your houses graveyards, for verily Satan flees from the house in which Surah Al-Baqarah is read. So again, that also implies that even the reading of Quran is not permissible in the graveyards. And he forbade the whitewashing of graves, building structures over them, writing on them, raising them above the ground level. So all of this was done in order to block the path to work shirk, which, was in, which involved worshipping uh, the dead, or worshipping Allah through the dead. You know, these are the two main ways in which people uh, are involved in ancestral worship. Either they pray directly to their ancestors, or, or, or the people of the past who they feel are saintly or whatever, or they pray through them. They ask them to carry the prayers on to, to God for them. You know, and both of these uh, acts are considered to be acts of shirk. And even the Prophet ﷺ's uh, grave, he had said, Do not make your houses graveyards, nor make my grave a place of festivities. Instead, ask Allah's blessings for me wherever you may be, for they will reach me. The term he used there, وَلَا تَجْعَلُوا قَبْرِ عِيدًا Don't make my grave an Eid. Eid, uh, a place of festivity or a time of festivity which occurs regularly every year. 
So every year you you set that you're going to go to the Prophet Sallallahu grave at such and such a time. You know, don't make my grave. And of course, if that's not the case for the Prophet Sallallahu then it shouldn't be for anybody else. You know, some people have the practice, for example, the last uh, Friday in Ramadan, they go visit the graves of their ancestors, you know, or they set some day in the year which they go to the graveyard, you know, whether it's in Ramadan or outside. Doing that, once you've done that, where you come regularly every year at that time, the whole family, it's a family tradition, you go and visit, you know, your dead relatives at that time, this becomes Eid. That becomes a form of Eid. Because Eid means a gathering, a festivity, which takes place regularly every year at the same time. Right? So, this is not uh, permissible uh, Islamically. And even when people go for Hajj, uh, some people, when they're going for Hajj or Umrah, they make a part of their intention to visit the Prophet Sallallahu grave. And in fact, there are even some narrations uh, which are fabricated, inauthentic, which says whoever comes for Hajj or Umrah and doesn't visit me has treated me badly. فَقَدْ jafani, You know? But this is not authentic. It is false. But a lot of people believe this and it's in the little books that people get for Hajj and Umrah. And so they make a point of coming to Medina to the grave of the Prophet Muhammad Now visiting the Prophet Sallallahu masjid, this is something recommended because the Prophet Sallallahu had said, لَا تَشُدُّ الرِّحَال إِلَّا إِلَى ثَلَاثَةِ مَسَاجِدِ المسجد الحرام ومسجد الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ومسجد الأقصى Do not travel except to three masjids. Masjid al-haram, that is the Kaaba, the Masjid of the Messenger, and the Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. So it is permissible for one to set out on a religious journey to only these three mosques. To go to any other mosque, or to go to a grave, or to go to you know, any um, historical uh, monument, etc., to set out, believing that you're doing something pleasing to Allah, meaning you've made it a religious journey. If you're just sightseeing in an area and something you know, is there, you go and see it, no harm. But for you to make an intention, I want to go to Egypt to see the pyramids. No. Islamically, this is not acceptable. You know? Even though you can say, oh, well, my intention is not religious, I'm not seeking a lot of pleasure from it, I'm just enjoying. But, what are the pyramids? The pyramids are the graves of the pharaohs. So to make an intention to go to visit the graves of the pharaohs, this is forbidden, Islamically. Much less, you know, to, uh, of course, to go to visit graves of, of Muslims, so-called Muslim saints, Ajmer, and all these other places that people you know, gather at, you know, in the thousands and hundreds of thousands every year. This is not acceptable Islamically. Uh, in fact, there was a narration, uh, Abu Bushra uh, had said, when he was uh, coming back from a trip, uh, and he met Abu Huraira, and um, he mentioned to him that he had gone to Atur, the Mount Atur, uh, where he had made some prayer, gone there and just made some Nawafil prayers, right? Voluntary prayers. Abu Huraira had said, If only I had caught you before you left. For I heard the Messenger of Allah said, Do not travel to other than three mosques. And he mentioned the hadith. You know. So practices of people, you know, today, uh, for example, unfortunately, even in Medina, they have this, um, what they call ziyarat, where they take people around to visit khamsat masajid, five mosques, or sometimes... In the past, it used to be seven. They reduced it down to five. You know, these fives are supposed to be places where the Prophet ﷺ stopped at some time or another. You know, Masjid al-Ghamama, supposedly, where it's covered with a cloud. You know, the Masjid al-Qiblatayn, where they changed the Qibla. Uh, masjid, uh, various masjids, you know, he, he stopped and paused f for, for a minute for some reason or the other. And they've placed and developed some little mosque there, which was not from the time of the Prophet ﷺ, because of course, from the, the Sahaba, they were very careful not to do this. In fact, Omar radiallahu anhu, after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, in his own time as the Caliph, he ordered that the tree 
under which people, uh, were, were, when the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions were going uh, to make <coughs> Umrah, and um, the, or oh, it was Hajj, and uh, the Quraysh stopped them, and he sent uh, Uthman radiallahu anhu as an emissary to go and negotiate with them. And the word came back that Uthman radiallahu anhu was killed. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu had said, well, who would, you know, come with me and fight the Quraysh? And they made uh, a bay'ah or pledge of allegiance under a tree. There was a tree there that he sat, and he made the pledge of allegiance with all of them to go and fight uh, in the case of Uthman ibn Affan. So that tree was a tree where this bay'atul ridwan uh, had taken place. It's called bay'atul ridwan. And... Um, People, after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu would go and see it historically, just as a historical thing, oh, that was the tree. Eventually, people started spending time there. Eventually, some people started making salah there. And eventually, it became a place where people started a point of gathering because it's the nature of people that um, that which is physical, which they can deal with, you know, you can see it, you can touch it, you can whatever. It's easier to relate to worship, you know, having these things. This is why idolatry comes up. You know, you wonder why so many people are involved in idolatry. Either you're worshipping a human being like Christians worshipping Jesus, you know, a billion of them, or you're worshipping, you know, various idols with monkeys' heads and elephants' heads and everything in India. You know, I've got another billion people doing that. You wonder, how do people get there? Why do they get there? What causes them to want to do this? Well, it is the nature of people. You know, that's why children, you notice children, they relate well to, to, to dolls, the girls, and the boys to action figures and so on. You know, they relate to physical, you know, uh, objects which can be seen, touched, and these kind of things. This is a part of our nature. And this is why the Prophet you know, was so much against the idea of uh, making of pictures, you know, carvings, paintings, etc. Because this attracts uh, worship. It is the basis for the worship of both Christians and Hindus. The idols and the paintings, the icons that the people have. So, uh, this is why is in Islam, you know, we have uh, so many uh, barriers placed with regards to the graveyards. You know, some people feel that uh, those who would say, no, the graves should not have these tombstones and all these other type of things, that they're extreme. But they're not extreme. This was the way of Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The graveyard in his time was a very simple thing. You know, it was just like open ground. Yeah, there are a few rocks here and there to indicate for people, well, this is the grave where your father's grave is or your son's grave or whatever. You know, it was there. They did have some indicators, which were just rocks. You know, they would put to mark a spot. But this building of structures, it didn't exist. Today, uh, we know that uh, in, in, in many Muslim countries, the, the graveyards are very similar to the graveyards of the Christians and the Jews and others, with all the structures over them. In fact, myself, I went to Cairo some years back, you know, and I'd heard about what they call the city of the dead. You know, I was curious to go and see it. And uh, on the way from the airport in Cairo, I had the brothers who pick me up, take me there. And the city of the dead, what is the city of the dead? It is a graveyard, huge graveyard. In Cairo, it's ancient, huge. But they built structures over the graves, right? And the structures came in the form of, we could say, three, uh, two bedroom apartments. That's, that's basically what you could say. There is a there is a, a living room that you come into, and there is a, another room on the side. This was your entrance. And then the, another room on your left side, one on your right, one on the left. Left side was where the grave was. Okay? So what would happen is that people would come to visit the, to the grave. They would camp out inside of the other room. They had an extra room there for camping out at. Right? So what happened that in time, as this population of Cairo increased, people f didn't find places to live. They started coming into the graveyard and occupying these places, right? You know, they moved in. So when I went there, I mean, you saw people, laundry was hanging on the outside, you know. And uh, uh, the, the government, unable to provide alternatives, had even piped in water. So you had water was in there, electricity, you know. You know so they, they became home. Some people even built second, second stories on it, you know. You know? So... And uh, even the owners of the graves, you know, felt that, okay, you know, they're looking after the grave, that's, that's fine, you know. <laughs> so um, it became homes for people. Huh? But um, uh, as I said, in terms of Islamic tradition, this is all, you know, as fun as it might seem, really against Islamic tradition. And um, Islam, 
is quite strong, its position is quite strong against uh, any form of grave worship. Now, there is an issue to consider here. They built the mosque over the grave. What is the ruling in Islam on this? And because it's important to understand because in many of our countries we do have mosques with graves in them. You know, what is the ruling about prayer in them? Well, if the Prophet ﷺ prohibited the building of mosques over graves, what was the intention behind it? Was it the actual act of building the structures? Or is it the prayer that is going to go on inside the structure? It's the point to think, isn't it? Because like the Prophet ﷺ had said, لَيَكُونَنَّ فِي أُمَّتِي أَقْوَامٌ يَسْتَحِلُّونَ الْحِرَى وَالْحَرِيرِ وَالْخَمْرَ وَالْمَعَازِفِ There will be among my followers those who will make allowable fornication and adultery, the wearing of silk for men, taking intoxicants and musical instruments. Right? <coughs> Talking about a time to come. Muslims will make halal musical instruments. Now, is it the instrument itself that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about here? Or is it the music which is coming from the instrument? The instrument is the means for producing the music. So when he says that the, even the instrument is haram, that is cutting the root even to get to the music. If You follow? So there are times that you find prohibitions where objects may be prohibited, but the intent behind it is what is the object is used for, or what is inside of the object, or whatever. You know? So similarly, when the Prophet ﷺ forbade the, uh, the building of mosques over, over graves, it was, in, it was to prohibit the prayer in that area. The prayer to a grave, or on a grave. This was the intent here. So where we find a grave in a mosque, basically we'll say that prayer in such a mosque is not acceptable Islamically. It's haram. Don't pray in there. Now what should the people of that area or town do if they come to the realization that this is wrong? They have to look at the situation of that mosque. Was the mosque there first? And then that person died and they buried the person in the mosque. Or did the person die and they buried him in a place and they built a mosque over him? Right? These are two different situations. If, it is, if the origin of the location was a mosque and a grave was added, then you take the grave out, put it in the graveyard, and you can carry on with the mosque. But if the place was originally a grave, then the only solution is to destroy the mosque. To destroy that mosque. Because that was an illegal mosque. In the other case, the mosque was legal. But the burial of the person in it was illegal. <coughs> right? In the second case, the building of the mosque was illegal. Because it was being built on top of a grave. Now some people will say, well, but here Allah mentioned in the Quran that those people who were believers built a grave over the seven sleepers. Well, if we notice the context of the verse, remember that was not the original opinion which Allah mentions. The other original people said, just seal it. But those who are in authority, they're the ones who insisted and did it. And we have enough evidence from the Prophet ﷺ's uh, prohibitions to say that for us, it is not permissible. Even if we said that in the past it may have been, definitely in our times it is not. But then again, somebody is going to say, what about the, the mosque of the Prophet wasallam? His grave is in it. We know the green dome. Right? The green dome which is over his grave, which is inside of his masjid. Well, one, it is important to know the history of the Prophet Sallallahu masjid and the grave. When the Prophet Sallallahu came to Medina, 
He built his masjid. Obviously, his grave wasn't in it. Right? <coughs> that is obvious. It's common sense, logic. Right? So, the beginning was a masjid. When he died, the companions were of different opinions. What should we do? Where should we bury him? People suggested maybe bury him in the masjid. Others said, no, this Prophet forbid. Uh, they were of different opinions what to do. Then Abu Bakr, he mentioned a narration he had heard from the Prophet in which he said, Allah has not taken the life of any of his prophets except they were buried where they died. Except they were buried where they died. So, on hearing that, the companions, they removed the bed of the Prophet ﷺ. He died in the room of Aisha, radiallahu anha, removed the bed, and they dug the grave right there and buried him in the room in which he died in Aisha's house. And then they sealed the door. The room was sealed off. And that obviously was not inside of the masjid. But you know that the houses of the Prophet's wives were right next to the masjid. He used to open a door and leave the house and go straight into the masjid and leave the prayer. So it's right next to the masjid. Now in the time of Omar radiallahu anhu and Uthman and Ali, with mainly in the time of Uthman and Omar radiallahu anhu, they expanded the masjid. But they, in, 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 in both cases, they expanded it to the right of the Qibla to in front of the Qibla and behind. They didn't do it to the left. Because to do it to the left would have included the house of Aisha. So it wasn't until the time of Abdul Malik, Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, the Umayyad Caliph, who was of the 8th century from 705 to 715, he extended the masjid for the first time in an easterly direction. He extended it for the first time to include the houses of the wives of the Prophet. Because already com the companions had died. By the time of Al-Walid, the companions already died. There were some tabi'in or students of the companion who were alive and they did advise him not to do that. But... He was the ruler, and he made that decision. His governor, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, had uh, carried out the extension. So that is how the grave of the Prophet ﷺ ended up inside of the masjid. And it wasn't really until the 13th century, in 1282, when Sultan Kalawun as Salahi, he built the first dome over the chamber where the Prophet ﷺ was. The dome. And it was Sultan Abdul Hamid in the 19th century who painted it green. So this is where we now have the green dome, which is now a symbol of Medina Masjid al-Nabawi, which is actually an illegal symbol. Though it has become common for us, it is actually a false symbol. Similar to the misunderstandings people have about Masjid al-Aqsa. You know, where people look at the Dome of the Rock, right? The Dome of the Rock, which is the one with the gold dome and the you know fancy looking thing, right? Which is an illegal structure. It is an illegal structure. But people think this is Masjid al-Aqsa. Huh? What it houses is a big rock where Prophet Muhammad was supposed to have uh, ascended into the heaven from there. And they have a myth, right? That when he took off, going up into the heavens, the rock wanted to follow him. So it raised up and then he told it to stop and he went on. So it stayed suspended above the ground. So when you go into the mosque, you can go from under and from above and you look at the stone, it appears as if it is suspended. But it's a trick. It's not real. 
not really suspended, but they've done it, you know, through uh, using mirrors and whatever to give that impression, you know, that you, you go under, you can see the bottom of the rock, and from the top it appears that this thing is suspended. But it's a myth. And we don't even know whether that was the rock. Right? So it's false. And so building structures like this, this is Christian tradition. You know, Hindu tradition, the other traditions. We don't have this. Building, you know, uh, rock uh, domes and things like this over artifacts. Because we worship without artifacts. This is something unique in Islam. See, all of the other systems, they have artifacts that they, wor that they worship with. We don't have what we call, what they call religious artifacts. We worship Allah without. We, without anything, we can worship Him. We have no need. The prayer. Unfortunately, the prayer rug for a lot of people has become a religious artifact. You know? And we now have prayer beads. Another religious artifact you know, for, for many Muslims. But in fact, it has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with Islam. Prayer beads came from the rosary. Have no doubt. You can go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. We have it in our library here. And read about the rosary. You will find the rosary described sounding just like what we call the uh, sibah or masbah or different names people give it, but the, the uh, uh, liquor beads. <laughs> huh? Described in a similar way, just the numbers are slightly different. And if you see, watch the Catholics with their beads, you see it's looking the same, just as a cross stuck at the end of it. Some people will stick you know, other things on the end of it. And I remember in Medina, we used to see, because Hajj people you know, would buy all kinds of things in Medina, one of the popular things to buy was liquor beads. So they used to import the best liquor beads came from where? From Italy. <laughs> yeah? And the, what would be written on the, on the box was Mohammedan rosaries. Hmm. Mohammedan rosaries. So this is the origin. We have, these are not artifacts. We don't have it. People, you know, will have all kinds of things about it. You'll see them rubbing their beads and blowing on them and wiping themselves and, you know, all kinds of things, expecting some kind of barakah, some kind of blessing to come on them from the use of these beads. And similarly, the prayer rug. You know, people become so, you know, caught up in the prayer rug that time for prayer comes. You don't have a prayer rug. Oh, I can't pray here. The ground's not clean. It's not taught here. No. For us in Islam, you can pray anywhere. I mean, unless you see uh, feces, urine on the ground, blood on the ground, okay, we don't pray in this. But just to say, the grass in a park, or a road, somebody has walked by here with feet that stepped some time in feces or whatever, you know, the shoes that you were wearing, you know, you stepped on the carpet or whatever, you can't pray, no. This does not make a place impure for prayer. What is impure for prayer is if you see on the ground, physically, urine, feces, or blood. If you don't see any of that, then you can pray there. That is Islam. But as unfortunately for many of us, the prayer rug has become an absolute necessity. We find we can't pray without it. You know, and on the prayer rug, we put a picture of the Kaaba, and then we wonder why the Hindus say, why do you guys worship the Kaaba? You know, we give them all the reasons to think that we're worshiping the Kaaba because we, we do this, you know, but this is really not from Islam at all. Anyway, so we cannot use the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu as an excuse to support the practice of building mosques over graves or putting graves in mosques. However, the question remains, what do we do about prayer in the Prophet Sallallahu masjid? Does it mean we should not pray in his masjid? This is a big question. Well, the point is that we still pray in the Prophet Sallallahu masjid. This was a mistake which took place. But because the Prophet Sallallahu masjid is not like any other masjid, we make that exception. And we make the mosque in Mecca an exception. And we make Masjid al-Aqsa an exception. Because if they decide to, to
to bury King Fahad, for example, in uh, the Kaaba. As I'm saying, this is just an example, you know. You know, a ruler of Saudi Arabia decided he wanted to be buried there, and they buried him there. Does it mean now, khalas, hajj is stopped, we can't pray? You know? No. Because prayer there has its own special merit. The Prophet ﷺ had said, Salatun fi masjidi hadha khairun min alfi salatin fi ma siwa illa al masjid al haram. A single salah in this masjid of mine is better than a thousand prayers elsewhere except al masjid al haram. So, this extra reward which is there for prayer in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's masjid. If we say, because his grave has been included in the masjid, you can't pray there like any other masjid, then we've made it masjid like any other masjid. See, we've equated them, but they're not equal. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has put it on another notch. There are three masjids which are put on another notch. The value of prayer there. So therefore, if anybody does anything there, which is illegal, changes anything, that doesn't change the fact that prayer there is still a part of our teachings. Ibn Kathir had narrated that when Omar ibn al-Khattab, uh, his, his uh, troops had found the grave of Prophet Daniel in Iraq, right, during the time of Omar ibn al-Khattab, the troops reported back that in Iraq they had found the grave of Prophet Daniel. His body was still intact, as if he was just buried. And there were some inscriptions over it, describing things of his time, etc., which led them to conclude that it was the grave of Prophet Daniel. Umar ibn al-Khattab told them not to let the people know about it. Keep it secret, cover it up, the artifacts, bury them, hide it. So, this was his practice. The story that people say about uh, in um, what they call Hijr Ismail, right? The back part of the Kaaba, that semicircular wall, that so many prophets are buried there. This is not true. Again, this is false. That was just a part of the Kaaba which was left out when they rebuilt the Kaaba in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu <coughs> Asadi, he pointed out that the story, in the story, what has taken place with regards to these youths, it contains evidence that whoever flees for the sake of his religion from corruption and temptation will be made safe by Allah. And whoever seeks refuge in him will be given refuge and be made a source of guidance for others. And whoever patiently bears humiliation in his path and for his sake will in the end be elevated and honored in unimaginable ways. Verse 22. سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم ويقولون خمسة سادسهم كلبهم رجما بالغيب ويقولون سبعة ثامنهم وثامنهم كلبهم قل ربي أعلم بعدتهم ما يعلمهم إلا قليل فلا تمار فيهم إلا مراء ظاهرا ولا تستفت فيهم منهم أحدا. Some people would say that they were three, the dog being the fourth. Others will say that they were five, the dog being the sixth. These are mere irrelevant guesses. There are still others who say that they were seven, and the dog being the eighth. Say, my Lord knows their number. And only a few others besides him know. So do not argue about them except with the clear proof, nor ask anyone about them. So, sometime after the incident of the revival of the seven sleepers, uh, people began to surmise as to what their numbers were. You know, as it spread, the story spread the numbers changed. And if you look, for example, in the Encyclopedia Britannica today about the seven sleepers of Ephesus, and it is there, they have a whole article about it, they mention in there that there are different opinions from the earlier times as to how many were there. 
and they mention three, five, etc. And they also mention their names even, you know, there are different narrations that they have indicating the names of the different sleepers, etc. Anyway, the point is that they were in doubt. They didn't know really what the numbers were. So Allah confirms their number as being seven. And this is deduced from the context of the verses. Because after Allah said that some people say there are three, the dog is the fourth, five, the dog is the sixth. He said, these were mere irrelevant guesses. <coughs> there are still others who say there are seven, and the dog being the eighth. And he didn't say anything. You see, the fact that that third opinion, he didn't uh, negate or say it was part of the guesswork, etc., is the indicator that that was the actual number. And the verse goes on to say, Say, my Lord knows best their number, and only a few others besides him know. Indicating that there are some who do know. This indicates that the best thing to do in matters like this is to refer them back to Allah, because there is no value in discussing such matters without knowledge. If we are given knowledge of a matter, then we, should, we may talk about it, otherwise we should refrain. Ikrima and as samak narrated that Ibn Abbas had said after quoting this verse, I am among the few who know the right number, and they were seven. He affirms that they were seven. And Ibn Abbas is known as the most or the leading commentator of the Quran amongst the companions of the Prophet. Or the, the statement, only a few others besides him know, meant that only a few knew their number before Allah announced that there were seven and the dog was the eighth. That's the other way of possibly interpreting the verse. At the end of the verse, Allah says, So do not argue about them except with clear proof, meaning that we should only discuss about the people of the cave using what has been revealed, which is to, le which is to leave knowledge about their number with Allah. It also means we should avoid discussion about them because it is useless to talk about and argue over a subject that is of no benefit and also because that knowledge is only with Allah. So Allah has advised us not to get into arguments about it. Even if Christians get into discussion, we can express to them what we have, what is revealed information for us. You know, they can express their opinions we can hear them, but don't get into arguments, extensive arguments with them about it. We have a basis, they don't. We'll break for the Adhan. So at the end of the verse, Allah says, So do not argue about them except with clear proof. We said that that clear proof was... Revelation in the Quran, which indicates that their numbers were seven. Or if we get into discussions with them, with obviously people of the book, etc., who may hold similar beliefs, or those who may even deny it, then it's useless to get into extensive and heated discussion and debate. I mean, we give them the information we have, we avoid, you know, getting into uh, extensive arguments about it because it's not really worth it. It's something either you believe, uh, if a person is a disbeliever, say for example they feel this is a myth, and they say this is just a Quranic myth that you have, well, we say well there's evidence from Christian sources that something of this nature did take place. you know, And the fact that they may record it, regard it as a myth, uh, doesn't change the fact that we have it recorded in two locations and um, uh, we believe that the information about it that we have is revelation, and that in fact it confirms the truth of it. And um, uh, Al Uthaymin, he suggested you know, the same thing that we should avoid letting these type of arguments become uh, deep and, and uh, affect our hearts, because sometimes we get into arguments about things which are not really that important. Uh, if a disbeliever denies the miracle of the seven sleepers. This is not that important. What is important is that he believe in Allah. So if we get all worked up and heated in arguments about 
the seven sleepers, and we leave what is most primary, what is most important, then we have misunderstood the da'wah. We have misunderstood the proper methodology in carrying the message. So that is a minor point. What we have to get to is what is basic and what is primary. And, you know, he mentioned too that, you know, it is the nature of people historically to get into these kinds, various kinds of arguments over things which are of no real value. Uh, in Christian tradition, in the Middle Ages, uh, Christian scholars, religious scholars, had debated how many angels could fit on the end of a pin. You know, this is in their books. A debate about how many angels could fit on the end of a pin. A pinhead, right? right? Of course, what is the value of it? I mean, this was an example of people involving themselves in useless arguments. And we have Muslims, unfortunately, who engage themselves in similar uh, arguments, arguments which were of no real value. You know, I think I pointed out to you once before, you know, the arguments uh, which have ended up in some fiqh books, for example, in the Shafi'i fiqh books of uh, uh, the 14th century, which are still looked at. You can find a mas'ala, which scholars debated about, whether if a person passed wind into a bag, tied the bag, then made wudu, because after you pass wind, you need to make wudu. So now if you pass wind into a bag and tie the bag, you made wudu, and then you loosen the bag and let the wind out, is your wudu broken or not? Right? Now this is an example of argument which is of no value. Who in the world is going to do that? <laughs> you know? So it is, you know, it is a meaningless argument. But unfortunately... We have Muslims of the past who got themselves <laughs> caught up in, you know, in this kind of argumentation. Uh, not to mention, of course, what they call scholastic theology or ilmul kalam, where this people got into, you know, concepts of tawhid and aqidah, you know, using arguments of, of Greek logic, etc. Uh, you know, where people are describing and discussing issues like uh, the concept of an infinite chain of events into the past and into the future. In other words, things having no beginning, you know. And this became, you know, an, an instrument of argumentation, which really for us in Islam, it is of no value and or benefit. Because we believe Allah is the creator. He is the only one without beginning and end. Everything else has a beginning and has an end. You know, and we, we, whatever we discuss or whatever we debate should be from that premise. You know, we shouldn't accept the premises of other uh, systems, you know, which has no guidance from revelation to show them the way. And for them now, anything becomes possible. Whatever your mind can think of, can be. You know? Nor ask anyone about them. That's the end of the, the verse. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Meaning that the state of the sleepers should not be asked about from the people of the book. Because the basis of their discussion is guesswork and speculation. It contains evidence, this phrase contains evidence of the prohibition of seeking rulings from one not suitable to give rulings, either due to his lack of knowledge regarding the issue about which he is asked, or because he does not care about what he says and has no shame to refrain him. If, he, <clears throat> if Allah prohibited this category, then the prohibition of rulings of this type are even more obvious. Prophet ﷺ had said, <clears throat> there are three judges, those who make rulings, muftis, making fatwas, there are three types. Two in hell and one in paradise. One who makes rulings without knowledge is in hell. One who has the knowledge and makes rulings contrary to his knowledge is in hell. And the one who has knowledge and rules according to his knowledge is in paradise. You know, so this a person in seeking, though as uh, being general Muslims, we all have to depend on scholarship. We have to turn to others and gain from them. We don't have sufficient knowledge to independently go to sources and take this knowledge all for ourselves. 
So we have to make what we call taqlid. We all have to follow some scholars. But we do have to make ijtihad in who we make taqlid of. That's the point. There is a point of ijtihad, and it is in who do we follow. So we should use principles. We should choose the person based on principles. Either because we know they've got gained a certain level of scholarship, and they seem to be practicing it, or they're known to be you know, a well-known scholar of a previous era or whatever, and that is the rulings of that scholar we're following, you know, either one or the other. But we should not just follow whoever, you know, the person who happens to be the maulana of our town, you know, or the sheikh of our village, or whatever. I mean, we should, we do have a responsibility to ensure that this person is in fact uh, the best person that we should be seeking our knowledge from. Because if we see that he is doing things contrary to Islam, but still he's been given the designation of Mawlana or Sheikh or whatever, then of course we should not take our knowledge from this person. If he is practicing what is contrary to Islam, obviously contrary to Islam as far as you can see, then simply because he has knowledge, or the people say he has knowledge, it doesn't mean automatically we should follow him. No. We have a responsibility to find uh, a person who has knowledge and is practicing that knowledge. This verse also contains evidence that though it may be prohibited to seek rulings from a person about some things, it may not be about others. For example, you know, remember I gave you the example of the Prophet Sallallahu when he told the people about in Medina about the uh, date palm trees, right? Not to artificially pollinate them. Then he explained to them afterwards that if I tell you something about the religion, then you take whatever I say. But if I tell you about your worldly affairs, then you know your worldly affairs best. Right? This is in Sahih Muslim, right? So me, this is indicating that, yes, you know, there are authorities that you can rely on for some bodies of knowledge, but not necessarily for everything. So though a person may be the leading scholar of that area, of that city, of that town, of that time, it doesn't mean that every ruling he makes is correct. Because if he makes a ruling in an area which is not his specialization, right? and I gave you the example of the issue of the earth turning and the rising and setting of the sun, then this is not that scholar's area he may come to conclusions which are incorrect. And you shouldn't really, if you want to get knowledge about uh, physics, then you should go to, you know, a physicist. Don't go to an Islamic scholar to get knowledge about physics. You know, you, this is, the, this is proper, the proper way of seeking knowledge. You know, that, but uh, simply because uh, we are prohibited, for example, to seek Islamic knowledge from a physicist, it doesn't mean that we don't seek any knowledge from that individual. Okay, um, we don't have enough time to do the next verse, so we'll leave that until the next session. If there are any questions that you'd like to ask concerning verses uh, 21 and 22, Okay, brother's question, is it permissible to visit the grave? Of course, Prophet Sallallahu had said, I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves. In the early days of Islam, in Mecca, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade the visiting of graves altogether. But now, he said, go and visit them. Because they are reminders. They remind you of the hereafter. So it is a rec it's recommended to visit the graves. And uh, there... The Prophet Sallallahu had taught, you know, what should be said when one visits the grave. Aisha radiallahu anha had asked the Prophet Sallallahu you know, what should we say if we go to the graveyard? And he said, there's a particular dua he taught, and there are different narrations of it. As-salamu ala ahli diyar min al-mu'mineen wal-muslimin. Wa yarhamu Allahu al-mustaqdimina minna wal-mustakhirin. 
wa inna ila insha Allah bikum lalahiqun peace be upon the believers and the muslims among the inhabitants of these dwellings may allah have mercy on those who have gone ahead of us and those following us and we will insha Allah be joining you this is the dua or one of the narrations of the dua to be said when visiting the grave and one can make you know personal dua of course asking Allah to forgive that person etc etc but as we said we don't recite any Quran and people who want to recite Yasin and these type of things in the graveyards this is not permissible Well, uh, brother's question, are we restricted to the graves of Muslims? Yes. We're restricted to the graves of Muslims in terms of visiting and paying, you know, and praying for them, etc. Uh, if one has non-Muslim family and uh, you take them there because they need to see the grave or whatever of their relatives, whatever you do this, or your wife is a non-Muslim, she's a Christian, for example, you know, and she wants to visit the grave of her father, you may take her there. But of course, you don't engage yourself in prayer for the dead because it's prohibited for us to pray for those who have died in a state of disbelief. Is it permissible to make dua? Uh, so you forgive these people and these people, maybe they were not there. I mean, they say, we don't know whether what was in their heart, whether they were Muslim. I mean, the belief was right or not. Your brother's question, is it permissible for us to make uh, dua for, you're saying non-Muslims? No, not Muslims only. Muslims. But, uh, maybe not very correct Muslim. Uh, Mafirat, we, we know that he was not following correct belief. But he was Islam. He was if a person dies as a Muslim, you can pray for them. That's it. Uh, first question, um, if a person in Medina, for example, uh, the women's section uh, was behind the place designated as the grave of the Prophet ﷺ. So the grave now ends up in the, in the Qibla. Is that prayer there, is it meritorious or is it, you know, uh, disliked or whatever? Well, um, in this case where it is, uh, I mean, you have no other place to pray, you know, that is the situation of the mosque itself it's permissible and one makes one's intentions clear one makes sure in your heart you're not having in your heart the intention to pray to the prophet's grave right where one is to the side where in order to pray that way you'd have to turn then of course it becomes forbidden for you to turn in the direction of the grave uh, the other question uh, concerning the Taj Mahal of course, the Taj Mahal, we all know, is a big mausoleum structure built over a grave. And really, according to Islamic law, it should be leveled. Uh, the last question was concerning funeral prayer. If one missed the funeral prayer for uh, somebody, can they you know, go to the graveyard and do the funeral prayer there? Well, no, you cannot. You can't make funeral prayer in the graveyard. If there is a mosque you know, outside of the graveyard where the people may be, hold the funeral prayer there and uh, uh, you wanted, your group of you, you wanted to do that for them there. Uh, it is not from the sunnah, really. You missed the prayer, you missed the prayer. Others did it. Just make dua for them, really. You know, people have gotten into this uh, and extended it to become prayer for the absent, the ghaib. Anyway, it sounds as though they're making the khama now. We'll stop. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashadu wa la ilaha la ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Yeah, this is the